you just lift up your hands and worship him? Come on, all over your homes. Lord, we worship you. You are worthy to be praised.
for you. He has not left you. He knows exactly where you're at. Hallelujah. Yes, Lord.
Good morning and welcome to Promise of Victory Church of God. It is my privilege to welcome you to our home. We want to thank you for tuning in to worship with us today. We have more than one way to give. You can text, go online to podcog.com. You can go through our app. You can mail them to 47 Dennis Ridge Road in Colliers, West Virginia, or you can drop them off at the same address. We have gear for sale. I could brag about everything we have, but it would take too long. Simply put, if you want it, odds are we have it. Make sure you check out our gear online and on our app. There are several ways to keep up with what we are doing. You can subscribe to our YouTube channel, which posts all of our sermons. You can download our app. The app sends special announcements directly to you and puts all of our social media posts in one spot. And you can follow our Facebook page. We live in a virtual world, so let's take advantage of it. We have had an amazing time in worship, and we are now looking forward to hearing the Word of God and cannot wait. And we want to thank you again for joining in worship with Promise of Victory, Church of God. Praise the King this morning. Amen. Good to be with you, even if it is virtually. My wife's already expressed it to you, but we miss you. I was contemplating uh, this service all week, and Palm Sunday has never quite felt like this before. We're usually all together. We're waving palm branches, and we're celebrating the coming King. And this year, things have been stripped away. Uh, it's, it's down to the bare necessities, and somehow the essence of Christ never changes. And perhaps that's what he's teaching us through all of this, is that there's a lot of things that trap us, that bind us, that, that cause us to be uh, encased within things that really don't matter. But now we're finding out what really is important. And, and maybe that's what this season is about. If you caught the teaching on Wednesday night, I went deeper into that study. Uh, I've been thinking about Paul's letter to the Ephesians all week. He said, uh, since I heard about your faith and your love for all the saints, I have not stopped lifting up your name in prayer and mentioning you to my Father. And that's the way I have felt about our Promise of Victory family. So do know, and I know that most of you, if not uh, all of you, have received our letters and our prayer cloths, but do know that uh, your love for each other, uh, your love for God, your love for this house has caused me to constantly lift up your name in prayer. I'm praying now probably more than I've ever prayed before just because what else have you got to do? So uh, I'm studying, I'm going deeper into the Word, and there's things happening in the spirit realm that I don't think we're even going to notice for quite some time. So I want to begin by telling you thank you for your faithfulness. We had the largest month ever given online this month. And I know that means that there was a lot of first-time givers because that's the most accessible way for you to give. But I want to say thank you uh, for your faithfulness. And please continue to do what it is that you're doing. Some of you have mailed it in. Some of you have brought it to either this mailbox or the one downtown. And we are collecting those and bringing them to their appropriate places. So please continue with your faithfulness and God will continue to 
uh, to bless you. This begins typically what we consider the Holy Week. This is Palm Sunday, and we are going to, uh, as usual, have our Wednesday night service, uh, which is uh, one of the silent days of the week. Uh, you've got, uh, we know what happened to Jesus on Monday and Tuesday. We know that uh, Thursday was the Passover meal, and Friday, of course, was the crucifixion. But Wednesday is that kind of silent day where we're not really told exactly uh, what was going on in the story of the Holy Week. However, we are going to be having our 7 o'clock online service, and I want you to be prepared because we're going to take virtual communion. So we're going to be uh, uh, sharing the, the communion supper together. And if you've got crackers, use crackers. And if you've got uh, uh, juice, use juice. But if you don't have juice, find some Kool-Aid. And if you don't have Kool-Aid, uh, make some coffee or some tea. Or uh, use water if you don't have anything else. But uh, it's not the elements that make it special. It's the commitment and the communion with God that you have. So if you've got saltines or Ritz or Toll House, or uh, if you've got to use a piece of white bread, it doesn't matter. Well, Pastor, that's 11. Yeah, we're not under that law anymore, so don't worry about it. Uh, it's the act of the communion. So we're going to be taking virtual communion on Wednesday. Wednesday uh, because this is Holy Week. I'm going to begin this morning with the story of Palm Sunday, Luke chapter 19. And we're only going to read about three or four verses down, beginning with verse 35. And we're going to talk about the subject of waiting on something good. And basically, that's what this entire week is about. Uh, we were waiting on something good. And sometimes in the waiting is where you fall apart. Sometimes in the waiting is where you lose your faith. Sometimes in the waiting is where uh, all of the promises that God has made, and you've got them stored in the back of your mind somewhere, they kind of feel like this is taking longer than it should take. But I want to encourage you this morning to continue. If you're waiting on something uh, that is temporal or something that can be shaken or something that is just for the moment, then you can go ahead and let that go. But if you're waiting on something good, I want to encourage you to keep on waiting this morning. Luke chapter 19, beginning with verse 35, says, They brought him to Jesus, uh, him being a donkey. They brought this donkey to Jesus, and they threw their own clothes on the colt, and they set Jesus on him. And as he went, many spread their clothes on the road. Then as he was now drawing near to the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and to praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, and pay attention to this verse in verse 38, Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Pay attention to that one phrase because this is what I'm going to base my entire message on this morning. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Understand why that phrase is important. These people who are shouting, blessed be the king, were excited. They were excited because they have been waiting 2,000 years for the king. As a matter of fact, it's been 700 years since the prophet Isaiah declared, for unto us a child is born and unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And the, the increase of the government and the peace shall be no end upon his throne. He will sit on the throne of David. So I want you to understand, they have been waiting for thousands of years for something good. They have been waiting a long time for something good to happen. And now they are expressing their excitement because something good, in their eyes, something good is about to happen. The Bible says that they declared him the king, and they were waiting on something good to happen, and they believed that a king was coming. If you go all the way back to the beginning, God walked with Adam. The Bible says in the cool of the day, he and Adam had conversations daily. Sin came into the picture and it fractured the relationship between God and his creation. And God raises up a man named Abraham. And with Abraham, he establishes a new covenant. And so it was for generations that God continued to try to restore a broken relationship with his creation. God spoke to a man named Moses. His people were in captivity to Pharaoh. 
And he tells Moses, go down to Pharaoh and tell Pharaoh to let my people go so that they can come out and worship me. Now, I want to call attention to the fact that he was not just simply calling them out to the desert so they could have camp meeting or have a revival for a week. There is a deeper meaning to what God did when he told Moses to go tell Pharaoh to let his people go. And the deeper meaning is this. One ruler in your life must be dealt with in order for you to establish another ruler. He was calling them out of bondage. And when he told Moses to go down and tell Pharaoh to let my people go, he never said, tell Pharaoh to let Pharaoh's people go. He said, Pharaoh's got them, but they belong to me. They're enslaved to Pharaoh, but they're my people. And the deeper meaning to this is, you have to deal with one thing in your life before another thing can ever take over. And he was calling them out of bondage. He was calling them into a life of separation. Here's the, the, the crux of what I'm trying to tell you this morning. God was establishing a theocracy. And in a theocracy there is one king and he is a divine God and he sets all the rules and he is subject that we are subject to his decree. God had to deal with Pharaoh in order to get his people free. Can I tell you that you're never really free as long as the thing that used to control you is still chasing you. And this is why God has to deal with your old king in order for him to become your new king. You have to come to a point in your life where the past is dead to you. And you live without fear of being recaptured and taken back into bondage. There's a lot of people in church today that claim to be free, but they're not really free. What they really are is runaway slaves who are on the loose. And they're scared to death that their old life is going to catch them and take them back into bondage. That's why God drew Pharaoh down to the Red Sea and drowned him in the sight of Israel because he wanted Israel to know that their old king was dead and was never going to chase them again. Now he brings his people out and he makes them a nation of people. And then in the New Testament, you and I are called a holy nation. Mm -hmm. A holy nation. I was raised in the old church. I was raised in the old church where this is not proper attire for a preacher. Because we were a holy nation. What they taught me in the old church was that being a holy nation meant that women shouldn't wear makeup. They should all have dresses on and their hair up in a bun and not wear any jewelry. Men are supposed to wear sports coats and ties. And by the way, if a preacher ever took a jacket off in the pulpit and had short sleeves, people would get up and leave the facility. So we were the only people at summer uh, time would be out at the park having uh, Sunday school picnics and we'd be in jackets and ties and the ladies would be in long denim skirts and somehow we thought that made us a witness for God. But God doesn't call us a holy nation so we would dress the part. He calls us a holy nation because we're supposed to be set apart for the use of the king. And it doesn't matter what it is on the outside, it matters what's happening on the inside. Because here's the problem. He led them out of Egypt, but once they got out of Egypt, they started running into other people. Have you ever noticed how easy it was to raise your kids before they went to school and before they got around other kids? Because when you had them in a controlled environment, you controlled what they thought. You controlled the music they listened to, the kind of books that they read. You controlled what they were exposed to. But once you sent them to school, they started coming home with stuff that don't make a lick of sense. They listen to music you don't allow in your house. They're saying phrases that you don't use in your house. And you wonder, where in the world did you get that stuff from? The problem was your training became contaminated by their exposure to people who serve gods that are not yours. And they do not hold to your beliefs. And so once they got contaminated, they brought that contamination into your atmosphere. Israel began fellowshipping with other nations who had kings who sat on thrones and lived in castles. And they decided they wanted a king as well. They broke God's heart because God wanted to be their king. He was trying to establish a theocracy, but they wanted a monarchy. Why did they want a monarchy? Why did they want a visible king? Because as they told God, everybody else has one. 
Can I tell you, child of God, it is a dangerous thing when you want to start being like everybody else. It is a dangerous concept when you want something just because somebody else has it. Because people can want the craziest stuff. What they are saying is, everybody else has a king to bow down to. Everybody else has a king that bosses them around, and we want that too. God said, you don't know what you're asking for. If I give you a king, here's what the king's going to do. A king is going to tax you until you are broke. He's going to take all your money. He's going to take your prettiest daughters and marry them and make them his wives. He's going to take your strongest sons and send them to fight wars that he started but doesn't even fight himself. And everything you own will belong to the king. And they said, yeah, that's what we want. People can want the craziest stuff. But they frustrated God to the point that he agreed to give them what they asked for. Can I tell you, I begin every day that I live and breathe asking God to give me the wisdom to only want what he wants for me. I start every day saying, God, please don't give me anything that you don't want me to have. You need to be very careful what you ask for because you just might get it. You need to be very careful. I ask every day, God, give me the wisdom to only want for my life what you want for my life because I will ask for stuff that is out of bounds. They insulted God. They hurt God's feelings. They said, we want a king that we can see because their idea of what a king was and what God knew the reality of a king was was two different things. So God gave them what they asked for. He gave them a man named Saul. God said, I want to be your king, but you don't want me. You've rejected me, so I'm going to give you Saul. Pay attention to this point. Your substitutions will never measure up to what God has in store for you. I'm going to say that again. Your substitutions will never measure up to what God has in store for you. And because they rejected God as king and they moved into a, a monarchy, they had a series of kings. And their lives were turned upside down. And it all began under the uh, fellowship and the rulership and the uh, wisdom of a man named Moses. They broke their covenant with God. Moses upset God. And they spent 40 years walking around the same mountain. The path to something good, and this is, this is where I'm going to get into Palm Sunday's message. The path to something good. We're waiting on something good. The path to something good often leads through the dust of the wilderness. Moses had done his part. And now it's time for Joshua to do what God raised Joshua up to do. It's not God's plan for his people to just cope. He wants us to be more than overcomers. And, and I've come to church this morning. I know you're not able to be with me, but you're watching by live stream. I want you to understand on Palm Sunday, he's not dead. He is still alive. He's not done with the church. It, it, just because we're not able to gather together under one roof, just because some of you can't go to your work or go see your uh, elderly uh, relatives or you can't go where you want to go and do what you want to do, please understand God is not finished with the church. As a matter of fact, in a lot of ways, I believe God is just warming up. I think that he's just now getting started on something good. I, if you're going to wait on something, don't wait on temporal things. Don't wait on transitional things. Don't wait on uh, on things that can be substitutions and things that can be thrown away. Don't wait on artificial things. Wait on something good. And I'm waiting on Jesus to do something that we've never seen before and act in ways that we never saw him act before. I'm waiting on something good. Now understand, Moses led them out, but Moses could not lead them in because of one act of disobedience. So it passed to a man named Joshua. And Joshua represents people who are walking by faith. It's one thing for you to wait for something good that you can see. Joshua represents those of us that are having to wait on something good and we can't see it yet. We're waiting on a promise. We're waiting on fulfillment to prophecy. And we don't even know what it is exactly supposed to look like. But we're waiting by faith. 
See, Moses spoke to God face to face. The Bible says he was a friend of God and God talked to him face to face. But Joshua is operating by faith alone. He brings them across the Jordan River and they end up in the promised land. And now there is no more wilderness. There is no more walking. They are enjoying the fruit of the new land. But one thing I want to point out to you before I move on is that the manna that they used to eat in the wilderness ran out because a change takes place. When you are waiting on something good, you have to stop settling for what used to be. If you're waiting on something good, you've got to be willing to let go of the old so you can grab hold of the new. If you're waiting on something good, you've got to be willing to transition from a place that you used to be happy in because God's got something better for you over here. I want you to hear this preacher this morning. The wilderness used to be a holy place, but now it's time for something good to happen. And that he starved them in the wilderness to get them to leave the old so they would come into the better provision ran out where they were some of you are struggling today trying to figure out why your provision is run out where you are could it be that God is starving you where you are because he's wanting you to move into something better you're starving for love you're starving for affection you're starving for attention you're starving for faith you don't know where God is you can't seem to get ahead where you are why because God's not wanting you to stay in the wilderness it's time for you to move into a promised land so he will let your provision run out so he can motivate you to move on maybe sitting in the back and watching everybody else get blessed used to be your holy land but God's calling you out of that maybe you've always felt like a nobody convinced that you are useless but God is calling you out Maybe being sick for a season was uh, what God brought you through. And depression used to be a way of life. But he's calling you out of that. He's going to let you run out of provision so he can bring you into something better. What was acceptable yesterday won't be today. God's got a whole new level he wants to take you to. So Joshua received the promise. Here's what God told Joshua. Wherever... The soles of your size 15 sets down. I'll give it to you. Wherever your feet tread, God said, I'm going to give you that place. Oh, oh, th th this is good. Wherever your feet tread, I'll give it to you. Wherever you go, I'll give you that place. Wherever I take you, if you, as long as you follow me, I'll give you that place. In other words, it doesn't matter what kind of virus is in the atmosphere. It doesn't matter uh, how bad the job situation gets. It doesn't matter how bad the marital situation gets. It doesn't matter how bad the family falls apart. He said, wherever you put your feet down, as long as you are following me and going where I want you to go, there is no devil in hell. There is no sickness. There is no plague. There is no curse that can come upon you that will ever become bigger than what my mission is for you. Where you put your feet is what I'm going to give you. But you, you, everybody watching me this morning, everyone that will watch this in a replay, I want you to pay attention to this next point. You have to stop settling for the world's good when you are destined for God's best. As long as you are willing to settle for good enough that the world has given you, you will never get dissatisfied enough to move into God's best. God's got a place he's trying to take you. And he says, if you put your foot down, I will give you that place. But you have to stop being settling for the places of the world. The enemy has lived there long enough. Put your foot down. The sickness has dwelt there long enough. Put your foot down. The stuff has been chaotic long enough. Put your foot down. Everywhere you walk should be holy. Everywhere you put your foot should be sanctified. And the devil can't dwell in a holy place. So turn your house into a holy place. Turn everywhere you go into a holy place and just put your foot down. If I had y'all in this place this morning, I'd have you on your feet putting your foot down. I'd have you stomping all over this place. We would just stop service right now and just have a march around this place. Put your foot down. Because every step you take, you are pushing the enemy under your feet and taking back what God gave you. Forty years ago, Joshua saw the promised land. 
But the people that he was running with wouldn't believe what God could do. And so it took him 40 years to get to what God showed him was already his. Forty years, Joshua stomped his feet saying, God has given us this land. And it didn't show up. He was waiting on something good. And when you're waiting on something good, honey, nobody can talk you out of understanding that it can't happen or that it can't be. And I'm talking to somebody's faith this morning, and I don't know who it is, but you need to hold on because good is coming. God has promised you something, and his promises are not short. His ear is not waxed short, nor his arm short that he cannot fulfill. If God promised it to you, hold on. Something good is coming into your life. He said, I want to go take the land today. And they said, no, there's giants over there. No wonder there's giants. Did you see the size of the grapes these people are eating? See, once you've seen the promised land, nobody can talk you into something inferior. If you get a vision of what God's got in store, all the devils in hell can't talk you out of it. See, the devil can come along and tell you it can't happen, but you'll, look, you'll stand up, look him straight in the, in the eye, and decree and declare that everywhere my feet tread belongs to God. I've told this story in the church many times, both as an evangelist and a pastor. Scientists have studied the bumblebee for years. Scientifically, it is impossible for a bumblebee to fly. The wings are too small, and the body is too big. There's no way. Scientifically, it's impossible for a bumblebee to fly around from flower to flower. The thing is, the bumblebee don't know that. Now, I'm sure if you let some uh, naysayers and some church folks get a hold of a bumblebee's ear, they will convince him that it's impossible, and he'll start walking from flower to flower. But until somebody tells him, he don't know no better, so he just keeps flying. How does he fly? Because God created him to. And he just keeps doing what God made him to do because he's not listening to the people who tell him it's impossible. And I have witnessed God healing people, so you can't talk me out of it. I've seen the most hard-hardened hearts turn to dust in the presence of Almighty God. You can't tell me God can't save. I've been there where he made a way where there didn't seem to be no way so you can't tell me that God's not capable of still performing miracles he's done it before in church he's getting ready to do something good I'm waiting on something good I'm waiting on something good and the journey the journey has taken them 40 years they have been waiting on something good for 40 years that's hard it's been hot in the wilderness It's been inconvenient. It's been threatening. But most of all, it has been long. Can I tell you that the quick changes in your life are not the end? The stuff that happens at the Red Sea happens fast. But that wasn't the end of their struggle. It was just the beginning. There were still a lot of enemies they had to fight. In other words, anything you defeat quickly is not your real enemy. David killed Goliath in an instant. But don't shout too much when the giant falls because if he falls too quickly, that's not your real struggle. Hear me. He killed Goliath before anybody knew what was going on, but he ran from Saul for years. He he had an internal battle with lust that he fought with for the rest of his life. So just because it falls quickly at a Sunday morning church service, that's not your real devil. That's not the stuff that you are really going through. Your real struggle is going to take you some time because you got to wait on something good. Good stuff that's worth waiting for don't happen in a flash. The walls of Jericho fell quickly, but once Joshua got to Ai, he lost the battle because there was rebellion. Because the real enemy was not the walls of Jericho. The real battle is the rebellion that lives in the heart of man. So if it falls quick, if you get over it in a moment, that's not what you're really battling. You're really battling something that's going to take you a long time. But hold on, saying to God, because it's worth waiting on when you're waiting on something good. I'm not supposed to get this fired up when I'm preaching to a camera. Now I'm almost finished. I just want to point you to this last few points. We read the Bible like it's a distant story, like it was happening to other folks. But God's intention for his word is to bring it into your present situation. For instance, look at what happened in John chapter 4. 
It's easy for us to dismiss what happened at the well between Jesus and this woman as a one-off circumstance where he just talked to one woman. But I want you to understand that there's a lot of truth in this story that can be applied to your life if you're waiting on something good to happen. Jesus told his disciples, I know you don't want to go through Samaria. And he didn't say, I need my road dogs, my homies, my friends, my buddies, my pals to go with me. Here's what he said. I must need go through Samaria. He was with his disciples, but he didn't say we must go through Samaria. He said, I have a mission, and i got to go alone. I can't take you with me, which the disciples was glad about because the last time they went to Samaria, they tried to kill them. But Jesus said, I must go through Samaria. I've got to go there. I'm about to show you something about your life and your present situation where you're waiting on something good. I must go through. I must need go through Samaria. I don't want to go. It's not even safe for me there. Jesus said, he never said, I am longing to go. He never said, I've prayed about going. He said, I've got to go through this. It's dangerous. It's off-putting. It's inconvenient. And I've got to go by myself and nobody's going with me. But I must needs go. And some of you must needs go through what you're going through right now. And here's why. Jesus knew that once he went there, he would arrive at a place that God wanted him to be. I wish, I wish that somebody watching this video this morning understood that if it's okay with God, it needs to be okay with you. If it's okay with you, God, it's all right with me. I must needs go through this. It's inconvenient. Maybe it's a little dangerous. Maybe it's breaking my heart. Maybe it's busting me up inside. Maybe it's an emotional roller coaster. Maybe I don't enjoy it. Maybe I'm here all by myself, isolated, with no help. But I must needs go through this. I wish I could speak directly to somebody this morning because I feel like somebody probably is bearing witness with me. Maybe tears flowing down your face. And you understand you're waiting on something good, but it is not convenient. You're waiting on something good, but it's bringing a lot of pain out of your life. You're waiting on something good. And and you don't understand why you're struggling right now. Because let me tell you, because at the end of this thing, you're going to be better than you are in the middle of this thing. But you must needs go. You will never end up where God wants you if you don't go through this season. In other words, if somebody comes along and helps you, great. But if they leave you, something good is about to happen. If I get that job, wonderful. But if I'm standing down in the unemployment line, I believe something good is about to happen. If I walk away from this computer screen this morning, if I lay this iPad down and get my breakthrough, that's wonderful. But if I don't, devil, you hear me, I still believe something good is about to happen. And I will be down on my knees with my hands raised to heaven saying, God, you are good and I will continue to serve you no matter how long my breakthrough takes. God took them into the land. I preached all morning to get right here. I don't even know. My, my clock says I just started. God took them into the land of harvest season at a time of overflow and abundance. I preached all morning to get to this one point. God took them into the land. Notice what happened. They, they spent 40 years. They got to the river and the river was raging. Everything seemed to be against them. They're waiting on something good. They're waiting on something good. And it seems like everything that could go wrong went wrong. But I want to prove something to you. He took them when they finally got into the promised land. It was harvest season. And everything was blooming. And all the fruit was ripe. 
and everything was easy. And if they would have shown up sooner, if the river hadn't got in their way, if the enemies hadn't have withstood them, if they had not been delayed but not denied, the fruit would not have been ripe when they showed up. The harvest would not have been as full. And the work that they would have had to have done when they got there would have been harder. I want you to get this one point if you don't hear anything else I say today. While they were being inconvenienced in the wilderness, God was maturing their blessing out ahead of them. That's one of the best statements I've made in a long time right there. While they were being delayed and inconvenienced and holding ground, fighting the devil, they didn't know something good ahead of them was being matured. See, some of us are wondering, why is it so hard? I've been asking God for something good. Something good has to develop. Anything that happens fast is not that good. It takes time to develop something good. And God is developing something good out ahead of you. And sometimes it takes you longer to get there than you wish it would. But He's developing and maturing your blessing out ahead of you. So when you show up, the fruit will be ripe. When you show up, the harvest will be full. When you show up, you won't have to work as hard then as you're having to work now and today is Palm Sunday and I'm going to shout it something good's about to happen whether hell likes it or not something good's about to happen you say I lost my place I know exactly where I am because all the way back in Mark, Luke chapter 19 they were shouting blessed is he who comes in the name bless the king bless the name of the king bless the name of the king because they were expecting something good to happen because they were expecting the king to come and I want the king to come back into my life you hear me I want him back on the throne of my heart I want the king in my business I want the king to rule over my decision making I want the king to rule over my family I want the king to rule over my health I want the king to rule over my mind and to rule over my finances can I tell you this morning I'm expecting something good to happen because I think the king is coming and I want him to rule over my mouth because I'm tired of my tongue running wild and saying what it wants to say and doing what it wants to do I want you to know this morning that the king is coming and I'm not talking about coming in the rapture I'm not talking about coming in a manger in Bethlehem. The king is coming to your life. He's coming to your house. The king is coming to fight your sickness. The king is coming to set the captive free. The king is coming. You ought to get up every day and tell the devil you might as well step out the house because the king is coming to my house and he will rule when he gets here. The king is coming. How do you know, Pastor? Because I've been waiting on something good. And sometimes my blessing has to mature. Sometimes it has to ripen before God will allow me to touch it. And it's not always easy. But God's delays are not His denials. And the pressure that you feel in the waiting, hear me, child of God, will be rewarded once you enter into the promise. I know it's hard right now. I know how difficult it is. You feel like you're on a leash. You feel like you want to run, but you can't even crawl yet. I, I get it. I understand. I've been there, and I'll be there again if the king don't come back and take us home. Because here's what I've learned about God. For every promised land that I encounter, there's another one even greater that I've not yet seen or asked for. I have not seen nor entered into the heart of man the blessings God has in store for his people. That means that the stuff I'm praying for today I didn't even imagine it 10 years ago. Do you hear me? And if he doesn't come back and claim his own very soon, that means 10 years from now, you're going to be receiving things that you don't even have in your heart to ask him for today. So the one thing I want to encourage you to do on this Palm Sunday is to wait on something good. Stop settling for the world's mediocre. Stop settling for what the devil has offered you. And hold on to God's promises and wait for something 
good. Because here's what I found out about God. Every time I reach good, he's got something even better. He gets gooder and gooder and gooder. And beyond what I can imagine or think, God is already working on. So hold on. On Palm Sunday, wait on something good. The king is coming. And when he comes, he comes with healings in his wings. When he comes, he comes with deliverance. When he comes, he gives sight to the blind and opens the deaf ears. He lets the lame leap and run and praise God. He brings marriages back together. He restores households. He causes broken hearts to be mended. He is a bridge over troubled water. He's the lily of the valley. He's the bright morning star. There is nothing too hard for our God. But you have to hold on and wait for something good. I have no idea how many of you are watching right now. I don't know how many people I'm speaking to, but it doesn't matter. This message is universal. Wait on something good. Don't let the devil talk you into settling in the wilderness because God's got better for you. Allow me to bless you this morning before we dismiss from this virtual reality surface. Allow me to bless you that you will hold on God, right now, would you bow your heads with me wherever you are watching this morning? God, right now, I want to speak to households. If there's one person in the house, if there's 13 people in the house, I speak to the households, God. That they will hold on and wait for something good. God, I'm, I'm speaking to those that have been wounded I'm speaking to those that the devil has tried to put depression in their way and anxiety in their way and worry and doubt and fear. I speak to them right now that they not settle in this land for mediocre, but that they will wait for something good. Because God, I believe that through this time of separation and isolation, you are working on the hearts of men and women and you are drawing us closer to you. And you want us to wait for the best. God, you are the best. You are the creator of all things. And God, you have us in the palm of your hand. I pray right now and I speak life over every person. I just feel this morning that you want to break depression off of someone. Would you touch them in the name of Jesus? Let your Holy Spirit break the yoke of bondage. The anointing go forth. If I've ever been anointed, God, allow this word to be anointed to break the yoke of depression off of someone's life so that they will hold on and wait for something good. Depression will try to get them to stop in the wilderness and accept the world's good instead of waiting for your best. God, help them right now to be broken in the name of Jesus. Set the captive free. Heal those that have brought their wounds to you this morning. And for every person that thought about giving up, every person that thought about surrendering, God, I speak life to them right now that they will hold on, that they will get a new grip with their tired hands and stand up on their shaky knees and give you glory and give you honor and praise in the midst of their suffering. And you, God, will give them the strength for the moment to endure. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. And amen. I pray for you daily. We miss you incredibly. And we pray today that this word, this worship has blessed you. Uh, we're going to be in touch as often as we can. We don't know exactly how long this is going to be. We know it's for another few weeks at least. But we may try some different things. And don't, don't forget Wednesday at 7 o'clock on our church Facebook page. Uh, we will be having uh, our Bible study, but I'm going to cut it a little short, and we're going to take virtual communion together. So I hope to see you all there. Uh, I love you. We love you. Uh, we appreciate you joining us. There's no need in us doing this if you're not going to be part of our church family. And until we meet again, God bless you. Take care.